Okay, so now we're going to go into something of an overview about what Mark is saying as an addition to Scripture. And it really matters because part of the whole um, proof that somebody saying something really is speaking for God is that what he says proves true. Okay, that's a really important point. You know, I'm really sick to death of people claiming that the Catholic Church determined what Bible is. Because the Bible was known as the Bible long before they existed, and they didn't exist until under Constantine. Okay? Council of Nicaea was like, Oh, what books are the Bible? Well, honey, if you don't know by now, you don't need some stupid counsel. And if you need some stupid counsel, you're too dumb to know what's the Bible. And they didn't pick it right either. Okay? They picked books that aren't part of the Bible as if they were. All right, and then later on, oh, well, these books are part of the Deutero canon. Well, no, they're not. They're just books that you liked, but they're not God's books. So how do you establish what is God's books? Well, how do you establish what's the truth? Well, back in Job, which, you know, is a book of the Bible, how do you know? Elihu says, that's one of his first speeches, the ear tests truth. If God exists, he wants you to know the truth. He wants you to know him. So if he wrote some book, he wants you to know what's in it. And if you start to get that book and you read it, you will know directly from him he witnesses to your soul. That's John 14, by the way. I'm not just making it up. It's also Jeremiah 28. And here's where we get into the impact of and being able to prove, to prove directly from text, yeah, this guy's writing for God. Prophet, the word, prophet. P-R-O-P-H-E-T. It means somebody who is a special emissary appointed by God directly to talk to people. And one of the things that every prophet is supposed to do, besides teaching you the truth about God, this is distinct from a rabbi or a, a pastor, okay? They are supposed to predict the future, and if it comes true, then you know that they're speaking for God. And every single prophet in the Old Testament both taught you stuff about God and taught stuff about the future. And that's how you know these four Gospels, we haven't gotten to John yet, are actually from God because they talk about the future and you can test them for whether or not that stuff comes true. For example, wait a minute, I'm going to have to cough. <coughs> this is Matthew. It's Matthew 24. He's writing in 30 AD, which he says, tying himself to the last book of the Old Testament in Matthew 1 via the begats. You have to actually count the syllables to know that. But then at the time that that gospel came out, somebody would have been counting those syllables and Matthew himself would have explained why he did it that way. Wait a minute. <coughs> Sorry. So, back up here. The beginning of Matthew 24. This is all the future. Okay? Matthew saying something about hi. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this is an informal dateline. It's 30 AD and it's 16 years after Augustus died. Wait a minute. <laughs> I may have to stop this video. Um, but it's being 30 AD, this informal dateline. This next one is the date forward. And you always use the cumes to get the dateline. 
40 years from now, Temple's going to go down. That was actually common knowledge at the time. So this is a way of affirming something that everybody knew. And then he's going future from there. Okay, so all these dates are future from there. Well, the same thing is true in Mark. Except Mark is writing in 69 AD. Okay, I already explained what the 24 is. The 43 is a kind of joke that I don't know how to explain. And he's also going forward. So as you live through the, the days, and you're using this, because something will tell you, hi, this is really from God, but you're not 100% sure. You will see, oh, well, gee, this stuff came true just like Mark wrote. Because you have the meter, because it's time, because this ends up being a satire per year, one syllable per year, as you go through each year, oh, wow, this is playing on the temple for this particular year. Okay, because this is also going forward in time. He's datelining, hi, I'm writing you 24 years before the millennium starts as, you know, a way to know what when he's writing that's tied to the theme of the text. But at the same time, it's also going forward 24 years. So as you're reading this from 69 AD forward, so it's 69, so let's count the syllables, okay? We're at 69. Kai ek poru wo menu au toy ek. Okay, so that's 10. 69 to 10 is 79. Alright. You already know when the temple's going to go down. But 79, 80, 81, 82. Right? Let's do it again. Kai ek poru wo menu au tu. Maybe I've got to run those syllables together. Ek. That's 10. So it's 10 years right here. So 69, early 69, to early 79. What happens in early 79? This is a real killer when you stop to think about how wry this is. And this is exactly how Greek drama and Roman drama were written. They were always political commentaries that ostensibly had to do with some other story. Because you, it was po politic to do it that way so you wouldn't get jailed. All right, 79 A.D., what happens? Do you remember? That's when Pompeii hit. But something else happened in 79 A.D. That's when the guy who took the temple came into power, and his father, who was engaged initially to take the temple, dies. The guy who dies is Vespasian. The guy who takes over after him, who was there to take down the temple, was Titus. So it's basically saying, hi, you took down the temple to Yeru. You took it down, so I'm taking down your dad, and now you get the burden of empire. Because one of the things that distinguishes both Vespasian and his son Titus is they didn't like being in control. I mean, they, they, how do I want to put this? They weren't all impressed with the power they had. They were big men, so they had big ideas and big needs, but they weren't like a Donald Trump who's all impressed with himself. Okay? They weren't shallow people. They were hardworking, honorable men. And But they took down the temple, which they shouldn't have done. You know, and Josephus wants to say, Well, Titus tried to save the temple. <laughs> Now, when that happened in 79 A.D., when Pompey got wiped out because of the volcano, in the same year uh, Vespasian dies, the Romans were extremely superstitious people, and they interpreted that as a sign. See, Samayan, that's why Samayan is stressed. It's not that God is, God doesn't communicate through stars in the sky and falling things and eclipses and all that crap. God doesn't do that. But people use those things. Okay? So they interpreted 79 when Pompey fell and Vespasian died at the same time as a bad omen for Titus. Okay? And they're both connected to Tuyeru. 
and then Titus himself will die at the end of that line. 79 to 81. Okay, 79, you can make this 79 or 80. 81, 82. I don't remember what month he dies, and I don't know what fiscal year is being used here. And, of course, after Titus comes Domitian, who is a singularly bad guy. I mean, what made him bad was he was something of a martinet. Okay? So, they're all connected to the temple, and they all die or rise to power during those three years right there. You don't think this is why stuff? So imagine you were living at the time, and this is only a few years after Mark's Gospel comes out, and you're looking at this text because you've been taught to count the syllables, and you're like, oh, wow, justice reigns. There really is a God. He timed the words to Yeru to the three guys who were involved in taking down to Yeru. Okay, you see how funny that is? So when you see these things come to pass then you'll know I'm speaking through that prophet that's what Jeremiah 28 says and if somebody claims to speak for me and is a liar then he gets killed or otherwise disabled by God and that's what happened to Harold camping and I suspect very strongly it's gonna to happen to Trump although Trump himself is not claiming to speak for God but everybody around him is so I don't know if it's like you know if maybe he goes on and they're the ones who get put in diapers like camping was or what happens but it's going to be a really crazy next couple of years to see that but the point is is that see if you're speaking for God your stuff comes true if I'm telling you something that's true about scripture God's going to witness to it if I'm saying something false he's going to witness to the fact that it's false we don't need a Council of Nicaea. What we need are the words, and then we evaluate the words because the ears test truth. If some book claims to be from God or some person claims to speak for God, you test the truth of what they say by listening. And usually within five minutes or less, you'll know, oh no, this person doesn't speak for God. And a person who really does speak for God is not hung up on the fact that he speaks for God. If anything, he feels kind of like nervous about it. But these people who sit there and say, Oh, I got a special revelation from the Lord, and I have this burden to tell you. Uh, you already know within 60 seconds, do not listen to that person. Because they're thinking of themselves as somehow being, I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> They have a high, they have too high of an opinion of themselves. And therefore, whatever they tell you is going to be kind of convoluted. God will use convoluted people too. But generally speaking, no. If you really know you're saying something for God, you're scared to death. Okay? And you think, okay, well, I just have to say this and I want to walk away. And you'll notice that's the way these Gospels are written. The whole New Testament is very matter-of-fact. There's no self-glorification going on by the writers. All right, they know it's their job. And, you know, Paul even says, I know I'm the poster child that you're supposed to emulate. And then he goes to great lengths to tell you what a jerk he is. Like in Romans 7. <laughs> yeah, if I'm a poster child, I better show you my bad side too. Yeah, there you go. And you're going to be put in these situations. It's not just these writers. It's going to happen to you too. There's going to come a time. Maybe you're at the grocery store. Maybe you're at a stoplight. Maybe you're sitting on a bus. And all of a sudden, some kind of conversation ensues between you and someone else. And you know they ask you some question. And you know you got to speak for God right then and there. That's why Peter always says, you know, be prepared. Well, that's what this is saying. You don't know the day or hour. Okay, but these days and these hours are being told to you. And you better know them. <coughs> Again, you end up knowing them. Wait a minute. <coughs> Sorry, I still got a cold. You end up knowing them because something will get to you that you're supposed to read this stuff or pay attention. 
and then you do and then you say oh wow this stuff came true so then you got the validation so that's what a lot of this stuff is at first mark is covering stuff you should already know from matthew and luke and that ends up showing hi yes i know what they said i'm tying to what they said and then you're evaluating the consistency of what Mark is saying, because you want to make sure he's not violating past divine writ. And this is part of what this is, like bona fides. Okay, then he introduces some stuff that's different or new. It, it isn't in what Luke said. It isn't in what Matthew said. So where did he get it? That's a really important thing that, that I don't understand why the people who teach this stuff don't explain. Okay? They seem to think that these gospel writers got their information from other people. No, they got it from God. That's the whole claim. Otherwise, why read it? Okay? Why bother? Okay, so when they say something different, or they change the text, or they move stuff around, especially right in here, they better have established their bona fides first. That yes, I understand the doctrine. Yes, I'm writing consistently with the prior writ. You can test me here. You see, you got all this stuff going on. That is, you know, when you stop to read it and go look up the history, it's it's accurate. All right, but then starting in here, which is way much farther down than Matthew or Luke put it. See to it that you're not deceived. Okay, Christ did this at 169. Luke put it back up to 112 to show costs. I explained that in previous videos. Okay, so why is why is Mark putting it down so much farther? Well, because it becomes an issue again. Okay. And not only that, but what Mark does that the others didn't do, and and is, is he goes into much more detail about what's going to happen and what you're supposed to say. And it's not like you're unfamiliar with the words because he's quoting Christ. That's another thing. How can he quote Christ if the Holy Spirit isn't giving it to him? Because Mark was not an eyewitness. Neither was Luke. Okay? And if they bring up new stuff, there's only one way they could have gotten it. Because they weren't witnesses there. They must have gotten it from the Holy Spirit, and this is how you test if they got it. So when they bring up something new, by the time their bona fides are established, it's like, okay, this is new information about the same period of time that I learned already in Matthew. What does it cover? And it's a lot more. I'm going to have to stop this because my coughing is getting really bad.